fragile <laughs> saying something right now. Like nothing I've ever experienced. I it's 
saw myself and what I feel like I knew of Bobby. It's amazing. That's a gift. The experience is a gift. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Oh, come on. Really incredible. Incredible. I mean, just a very different sensation than you've ever had before. I mean, I think the title's perfect, continuous eye contact. Really incredible experience. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask you about your experience? Well, I mean, the ceiling is more balls and all. He just gifted through time was changing their colors, bringing them back, getting very, very bright, like almost ethereal, and then getting a little darker again. Uh, music made you concentrate on what you're trying to look at. And I thought it was very, very interesting. Yeah. I never saw that. Thank you. Two and a half minutes. And there were four more minutes, and he said, Mom, I can't. I can't do that. You will. You will. I'm sure. I'm sure. We have to look at it when we have a moment. No, no, we're not interrupting. We're not interrupting at all. We have sort of our adopted daughter in Zoom films now, and she is killing herself working so hard. Anna. Anna Galta Rosa. Anna Galta Rosa, who once dined with, uh, and she sends her condolences, by the way. We spoke to her. We spoke to her in the um, She's, she's in Italy working on her film, and now she's taken her very contemporary art, and it has transferred it into images on rugs. And she has this, she has this amazing villa outside of Rome. That it is sort of a Palladian-like villa set in the middle of vineyards and with huge staircases. And she has created, they're already in place, these enormous abstract, really brilliantly really colored design uh, runners on the stairs of her. Oh my God. Done with film? No, done, done with textile. Oh, okay. Done with textile. Oh, this is her textile effort, which is different from the film, but she also did a sculpture of a different nature, but very similar intellectual point of view from um, Bobby. They had a lot of time. She loved pump pump. Oh. She, she, they got along with the pump pump. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we love them for their physicalness and brightness. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you. 
being able to occupy the observer and to pull away. That's, that's about the best way that I can summarize it. Well fed. <laughs> yeah. interesting about Bobby's work, especially for someone like myself who has never been drunk in his life and never taken recreational drugs, that immersive direct eye to eye or eye to uh, enhanced environment experience coupled with the music 
and the emotional experience of going through it does bring you out of yourself, enables you to give great consideration to elements that have to do with the hereafter, wider, expansive understandings of being. It asks you, it invites you to contemplate the universe, all within a very controlled experience that doesn't require any kind of inebriation or drugs. It's really incredible. It's a tribute to Bobby's ability to invite us to see a bigger, larger world beyond what we experience moment to moment. Thank you for letting me share this with you. What was it like? What was your perspective in there? Just whatever comes to your mind, actually. I felt very calm. I felt as if I wanted to stay in contact with myself. And um, wasn't surprised by, um, by the experience, but rather enveloped and welcomed by I just stay just, you know, how hard it is to stay in the present. This was the present. And how lovely it is. We came from Milwaukee today, so everything was rushing and get here. So the, the disparity between today's life experiences and this are take, it took me out of where I was. Probably just right That's what I have to say. I love them. Have you done it? And it's powerful. It's very, very powerful. powerful. I want to know about the music a little bit because the music that is connected to the, to, to the visual seems very um, seems very high. Like that it. I don't know if it's the tones or the, you know, the rhythm of it, but there's something very. Um, it's very really instinctual that there's something that is reaching to the music. Right. It's the rhythm on the, the. There's so many aspects to it that have been done with such care and intelligence and devotion. I, I, it's amazing. It is it's, amazing. So that, that is, I mean, I can see how. You know, staying where you are, staying where you are, and then letting it happen was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not speaking this. because I want you, I don't want to be in it, I want you to, but that's, it is amazing. It's my pleasure to do this. This is so powerful, and... Like and you're saying, it it's come from? From? and where does it come from? And it's just, it's a, a moment with yourself, most of all, too, yes. which is what very is difficult. What, what is, is that? that? Right. It's difficult to find that time or, or bravery even to be with yourself, I feel, for myself at least. Some who have been in it, you know, have really, uh, what I've observed, been very deeply touched and found not immobile. And my experience was different than that in that I didn't, I didn't feel that sadness. Maybe it's because I'm old. Maybe. But that I, I appreciated just the quiet and the, something being there with me. Not alone, but alone. And so, along with the miraculousness of there is some religious aspect to it. Mm. It's the soul. So what part of you is participating with yourself? You know, and maybe it's the soul. Yeah. 
and you know, I have faith. I happen to be a Catholic, so um, I don't associate it necessarily, you know, with religion. But I do associate it with a belief that I think many have, most have, in it, that there is there is a soul, there is an energy that's being tapped, it's being touched. I'm observing there, there it is. I mean, you can, from the outside, see someone experiencing that. My daughter's crying again.
Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Ansbach. I'm Bobby's dad. And first, I want to just thank each and every one of you for being with us tonight for this very, very special occasion to celebrate Bobby's art. I'd like to thank others without whom this evening would not be possible. And I'm going to do it in sort of chronological order. I'm going to start with one person who knew Bobby when he was still doing what he was doing in his art. And then we're going to go on from there. And I'm just going to quite quickly thank all of you who have participated so beautifully in making this night possible. I want to go back to when Bobby was still at RISD. And he was influenced and inspired by his very good friend, um, Jules Johnston, who is here with us tonight, and helped him through his hard times and his good times before he moved to uh, New York City. And then we're going to go from there into what happened and how this came about after Bobby's passing on July 5, 2022. In chronological order, from then up until now, to the best that I can recall it, the first two people who really got us thinking about what we might do to preserve Bobby's work were two people who are with us tonight. One, Paula Baldoni, from a gallery in Toledo, Ohio, and the other, Elizabeth Ferrer. Elizabeth, who will be speaking tonight. I don't really even need this microphone. Do we? You're just trying to shorten it, aren't you? <laughs> and Elizabeth Ferrer, who, and both of them, within about two days of Bobby's death, emailed or texted us saying, if there's ever going to be any effort to keep Bobby's work alive, please let us know. And that set us off into this journey. That was the beginning of the journey. And by that time, we had a, a, the attorney uh, without equal here in New York, Karen Kepler, to handle Bobby's estate work. And Karen guided us to the ineffable, undescribable Saul Ostro. Saul Ostro, he's back there. You can hear that strange laugh that he has. And Saul Ostro is the one who began this whole journey and then Karen and Saul and I and our driver went up and saw Bobby's work in, uh, in, um, uh, up in Beacon. Saul, along with Elizabeth and uh, Paula, guided us through this entire project. And then soon after that, we were able to engage someone who is absolutely without equal and without whom none of these machines that you see tonight would be here, without whom none of this would exist and without whom there could be no future for this work if there is to be one. And that person is Ethan Bond Watts, who helped us through thick and through thin with Bobby. Thank you, Ethan. <laughs> to Phoebe and Jimmy and Liz, to whom the catalogs are, are uh, they're the people, what do we call it, Jane? Dedicated. dedicated. She helps me with, I mean, I'm getting old. <laughs> so, yeah, dedicated. Uh, the three of them who stood by Bobby through thick and through thin and who meant so much to him and to us. And they have stuck by Bobby throughout his trials, tribulations, his amazing creations and his successes, and we love the three of you. To Carson Fox Harvey, actor extraordinaire, who agreed early on, he left Beacon with his wife, uh, his partner Tina, soon after Bobby died, he had become very close to Bobby, and Bobby had said he was the person of all the people that Bobby knew who best guided people into these machines the way Bobby did. Carson and Tina came out from Chicago. Carson trained everybody last weekend, the guides you see here and we'll be seeing as we go forward. By the way, before you leave, on the back shelf are catalogs. If you don't already have one, 
please take a catalog when you leave. To David Goodman, to, who Saul engaged to work on this project, and whom Saul describes now as the producer of this entire thing. So thank you, David Goodman, producer. To Mia Greenberg, to Mia Greenberg, the digital archivist who preserved a wealth of Bobby's information and documentation, which would otherwise have been lost. To Susan Bowman for overseeing the design and production of the catalog. Jessica Holmes for her proofreading skills. To Christopher and Constantine. You will hear from Christopher in a few minutes. Christopher and Constantine, through Bobby's lifetime, bolstered Bobby's dream. And you'll hear more from Christopher, and I think you'll be in for an interesting... You'll, you'll learn a lot. I have learned a lot in the, what, um, nine days that I, since I first talked with Christopher and Constantino. To Madison Velding Van Damme for creating and curating the invitations and helping us out in so many innumerable ways to make this project a reality. To Sarah Griffin for her myriad skills in reaching out to spread the word about Bobby's work. To my brother-in-law, where's Bob Hillis? There's Bob Hillis. To my brother-in-law, Bob Hillis, who provided this beautiful hospital bed from his company, Direct Supply. So if any of you are in need of long-term care or whatever, there's the guy right there. Finally, and almost done, to Bobby's brothers, Michael and John, for their love and full support in this work and effort. To my wife, Bobby's mother, Jane, who bore him, loved him, supported him throughout his life in the best of times and the worst of times. And if I may, finally, to Bobby. Thank you. It is, thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ethan Bond Watts to say a few words. That's Ethan right there. In the shirt that Jane got him to wear when he went to Christopher and Constantino's for dinner five years ago. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, guests. Thank you, friends and family. Um, you yeah, have a few remarks about Bobby. Bobby Anspach is my friend, collaborator, and soul brother. For those of you who don't know him well, his favorite color is rainbow. His favorite food is sauce. His favorite places and activities were art park walks and riverside picnics, material, material failure mode testing, and raucous dance parties, and sharing his art with folks like us. He took his time telling a joke, especially if it was one you've heard before. For example, when he first got to New York, his mentor told him, it's going to be tempting, but don't name drop. That was Leonardo DiCaprio who told him that. <laughs> Bobby asked big and probing questions, like what are the sources of greed and inequality? Or why do dried grapes and plums get their own words, but not apricots? For Bobby, here and now, the present moment is the only place and time that will ever be. His gesticulations would stretch and sparkle. His unblinking eye contact mesmerized, beautified, forgave, and bestowed grace. His hug was a silk shawl. His kiss was a punk rock butterfly. Bobby never met someone he couldn't befriend, and he never met a rule he didn't want to bend or break, except the golden rule, which was sacrosanct. Bobby was an athlete and a fierce competitor. Touch football was full contact. The ping pong table was a gladiatorial arena. Uno was a game of chess, and chess was real politique. He loved to win, hated to lose, but most of all, was nourished by the striving. 
Buddhism and meditation. For Bobby, meditation was a practice, a discipline, a lifestyle, and a profound source of power. Sometimes after we meditated, he would slowly rise from his cushion, which might have been a collapsed cardboard box. He would shake the lotus position out of his legs. He would stretch his back and hamstrings. Then he would pick up his phone and make the call. It was the call he had been putting off because he had felt intimidated, underqualified, or afraid of an undesirable outcome. The perspective and power he had recollected from sitting made his next clear step possible and inevitable. With clarity and grace, he faced the future by acting in the present moment. Bobby, at his worst, like the rest of us, was insufferable. There were occasionally brief and fleeting moments of brattiness, entitlement, and tantrum, but these moments were brief and fleeting and never directed at another person. He was tortured by war, climate change, and habitat destruction, inequality, and exploitation. His mission was to use this art to free the viewer from alienation, envy, and the dissatisfaction with what is. His agenda was nothing less than to help save the world from itself. The viewer is the center. Save the viewer, save the world. He carried energy in the tension of his contradictions. Old soul youthfulness. The thirst for novelty and the comfort of routine. He loved cigarettes and kale salad. Technology and unspoiled nature grand loving gestures and subtle paradoxical, paradoxical humor. He read Jacques Rancière and Susan Sontag, Gary Larson and Dr. Seuss. Rather than wax poetic on theory and literature, he applied it in his practice, his lifestyle and his interactions. Bobby is now at once walking in the kingdom of heaven and reborn in the cycle of samsara. He vibrates in the ether that enrobes us. Feel his energy. Let it give you power and strength in your mind, body, and heart. He is with us right here, right now. He is sunshine warming a flower meadow in early spring. He is the first touch of an old friend after not seeing them for years. Bobby is God's creation. He is perfect and so are you. These machines that Bobby invented, that we designed and built together with the help of many friends, embody his warmth, his contradictions, his power, and his conviction that you are perfect. You are capable of profound discovery and personal growth. You carry divine energy, and you are capable of divine action. It is our honor and responsibility as Bobby's friends, allies, and loved ones to be the storytellers, the guides, the role models for the spirit and values that Bobby lived by and worked for. Compassion, creative freedom, generosity of time, talent, treasure, and spirit, being present and aware of one's own experience, hospitality, irreverence and humor, being real and being honest. Bobby calls us to action, to mobilize and to spread the good word. True peace is possible. That what everyone is looking for has been right here the whole time, here and now in the present moment. Tell your friends and your neighbors, your colleagues and total strangers, see these machines, have the experience, tell the story. Bobby, I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Ferrer, who I mentioned earlier, one of the first people to say she would love to support an effort to keep Bobby's work alive, is a New York-based curator and writer 
former chief curator of BRIC, a Brooklyn arts and media ins ins excuse me, institution. She's also curated exhibitions for venues throughout the United States. Her writings have been published by the University of Washington Press, University of Texas Press, and the Museum of Modern Art, among others. We were so blessed to have Bobby's work in the Brick Biennial. We were so fortunate to have met Elizabeth and had the opportunity to talk with her. And we all here are so fortunate to read in the book, the catalog, what she has said about Bobby. And most importantly, we are so fortunate to hear what she has to say this evening. Elizabeth. Thank you so much, um, and Jane as well. Um, it's just such a privilege for me to be here this evening because, can, can you all hear me? Um, yeah, this is a little high. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Okay. I'm probably your shortest speaker tonight. Um, thank you. Um, it's really a privilege for me to be here tonight because Bobby was such a special artist uh, for me in a rather long career. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, our relationship and a few thoughts that I have about Bobby's work. Um, I think it's important to underscore the fact that um, Bobby's career was just so brief. Uh, from the time that he was at RISD when he first started the ideas and the studies and actually making the prototypes for these objects, which he all titled Place for Continuous Eye, Eye Contact, until his passing last year. I mean, that's not even a decade. Um, but he worked relentlessly at these projects and a handful of other projects like the stop uh, motion animation um, on the back wall. And he was just really, really dedicated to perfecting these objects, to making an experience that he believed in so strongly. Um, he didn't really have the time uh, to um, reach out to a lot of curators and critics, uh, the kinds of people who could uh, help further his career. Um, but, you know, it was kind of maybe oddly by coincidence, he and I connected, I learned about him. Um, I uh, was curating the Brick Biennial, uh, we were working on it in 2018. And the theme that year was the impossible possible. And somebody had told me, well, you need to check out this artist, Bobby Janspach. And I never heard of him, had never seen the work. Um, I reached out, we set up a time for a studio visit, you know, right, into, right in this space. And I arrived, uh, Bobby and Ethan were here. Um, there were maybe one or two uh, works on view at the time, but I saw these sort of glowing domes that were covered with all this electronic equipment that I didn't understand, and um, I was just entranced. And I would have to say that, you know, what, after experiencing the work, I had something of a visceral experience. I've, in, I've uh, as a contemporary curator, I've experienced a lot of artwork, including artwork that is participatory that does involve an experience, but there was nothing quite like this. There was such a quirky craziness about it, but also a lot of smarts, so much research that had gone into the, the fabrication of these works. And, uh, you know, he took a rather jaded curator and made me into something of a believer. So when I arrived, uh, Bobby and Ethan were here and they explained uh, what would happen. And it was actually, I think, the dome that's in the corner over there. Um, and there was, at that point, there was like an air mattress uh, with a tiger blanket on the floor. Right now it's sort of raised. But basically, I was going to enter into the dome and I was going to have an eye, an eye patch on one eye and then I was gonna make continuous eye contact with myself with a small mirror that was installed just overhead. Um, I was fitted with, eye, with um, earphones and then I began to hear this kind of beautiful new age music that just sort of kind of transported me and, you know, I'm kind of a high-strung person, but um, after a few minutes, I have to say, I just felt like I was melting away. Um, I, it just really took me into another place. I was completely calm, and I kind of walked out. I mean, I literally had kind of wobbly legs, and that's something kind of new for me. And um, I was also just so taken by the fact that everything kind of just began to glow into one. And this is exactly the experience that Bobby wanted to have. He wanted you to have an egoless experience, to kind of lose your sense of self and feel a connection that you had with everything and everybody. And um, sort of the colors all melted, sense of space melted. And, you know, I felt like Bobby really was on the road to achieving something just so interesting and unique and really important. Um, these works uh, come out of so many different um, 
elements of Bobby's life and his studies and interests. He was interested in neuroscience, optics, um, Buddhism, uh, different kinds of religion. Um, but above all, as, as Ethan so beautifully explained, he was very, very involved in Transcendental med Meditation. Um, he, was, he was a longtime student. And one of the main goals of these works was to recreate the experience that he had after years of meditation. And it wasn't just at that. I mean, that alone, I think, is very important and significant. But it was also deep at its core about Bobby's fear in climate change. Um, Bobby was very fearful of climate change. And he believed that by having this um, egoless experience, by having the sense of what it's like to, uh, to meditate at such a deep level, that one grows in compassion for each other and for everything around us. And Bobby just wanted to break down those barriers and to make us think in new ways about the world around us. And so I think it's really interesting that when we look at this work, we don't necessarily think about that. But Bobby just had these very, very high-minded goals in mind as he was creating these works. So um, in winter 2019, uh, Bobby and team uh, came to Brick. They installed uh, this dome. And um, at the opening, it was just pretty amazing to see one person after another who would arrive and kind of look bemused, incredulous, wonder what the experience was, and then would come inside. And after a few minutes, they would also leave, um, you know, sort of euphoric, very happy. Uh, at least one person left with tears in their eyes. And uh, Bobby was, you know, one of the highlights of the Brick Biennial, and I was, I was just so happy that he and I had made that connection. Um, several months later, Bobby contacted me and asked if I would sponsor his work in the uh, Spring Break Art Show. So that's like a big art fair that happens every year in Manhattan in these kind of alternate locations. It's called the Curator's Art Fair. And we put together an application. It was accepted. And uh, Bobby and Ethan and team installed a new version of the work. Um, this time it was being held in a midtown office building that had been vacated. Um, so he, he had a nice corner office and worked very hard at this machine that was sort of a variation of this one. Um, and that's one important thing. As you see, these are all rather different in kind of scale and appearance. Bobby was always trying to improve the experience. So he was always tweaking. The very early ones were these sort of um, standing domes with like hoods that you would have over your head. Um, he labored over this large tent-like piece, you know, picking out the jacquard and thinking about uh, uh, an experience where two people would have eye contact with each other. But this, the spring break version was really important to him because he, this was going to be momentous. Bobby knew, rightly, that more people than ever before would see his work at spring break. So um, he had something more along these lines. He had a raised gurney so that more people could kind of come in, in and out of the dome. And again, this was very successful, very meaningful for Bobby. I think, you know, he, he reached a lot of people. Um, I think within a couple of weeks, the COVID lockdown began. Uh, Bobby left for Beacon, and I never saw him again. Um, he did contact me a few months later. We talked on the phone, and he told me that he had this idea to take these domes on a tour to Walmart parking lots uh, all over the United States. And I have to say, I was really dubious. I gave him a few pointers. Uh, what would I know about putting art up in Walmart parking, parking lots? But we had a good conversation, and then, you know, he just, he actually kept at it. And in fact, he did have one work on view at the uh, Walmart in uh, Newburgh, New York. And then a few months later, he uh, did likewise in front of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, this time to attract tourists. So this was also very significant for Bobby. You know, earlier, he was primarily working within the realm of the art world. By going to Walmart, by going out to Fifth Avenue, where there's a lot of tourists, he was bringing his art to the people, and that was just so important to Bobby. He, really, he felt so strongly in this experience that he wanted to, to share it with as many people as he could. Um, I just want to close in saying that um, for all the altruism that's reflected in Bobby's work, and I think Ethan also hinted at this, Bobby was really a conundrum. I think anyone here who, who knew him would, would agree with that. Um, he had these impossibly high-minded, idealistic goals at the same time, he knew his ideas were grandiose. He knew he could not save the world. Uh, but he worked at it. He, he worked relentlessly to give form to concept. Ultimately, I think that rather than having this, this huge audience, his work boils down to an experience of one. There was a singularity of having a single person enter the dome or a couple people enter a tent like this. And you know, and when you had this experience, 
His aim was not to make a fearful art, even though he was uh, so fearful of climate change. Rather, he offered us a means of uh, making us feel as if we were melting away into the cosmos, even if fleetingly. He activated moments of sheer unexpected beauty unlike anything that his participants or I had ever known. So in the end, this beauty and Bobby's own quest to reach the sublime would have to be enough. Thank you very much. How do I do this matters? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Elizabeth, thank you so very, very much. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Christopher Highland. I need to shorten this because otherwise the bio of Christopher Highland would be longer than the time which is allotted to him to speak. So I will attempt to do that. Christopher Highland blends the worlds of business, civic, and international affairs and the arts. He's the founding president of Christopher Highland Incorporated, the High End Textile Company, and CEO and design director of Weld County Land Investors, which is planning Highland Town for 40,000 people north of Denver. Highland Quality Textiles, great, uh, Grace Opera and Broadway Stages, Movie Sets, Elevate Corporate, Commercial, and Hospitality Interiors, and Form Liturgical Vestments and Couture Collections, Boxer Muhammad Ali, Bette Midner, Nancy Wilson, Brad Pitt, Tom Clancy, Barbara Streisand, Mike Tyson, Sharon Stone, Madonna, and Heads of State, among countless others, are patrons. He has received six honorary degrees, Two honorary doctorates recognize his contribution to the intersection of design and civic involvement, namely those from the Savannah College of Art and Design and the New York School of Interior Design. He was Deputy National Political Director of the first Clinton for President campaign. He was Assistant Deputy National Political Director of the Clinton Transition. And President Clinton, in his book, My Life, writes that Highland's efforts significantly contributed to him winning the general election. Both Kosovo and Albania have awarded him the highest national honors. Highland, from within the Clinton campaign, set the initial groundwork on the road to Irish peace. Irish Voice, uh, a newspaper of record in Ireland, wrote an extensive article entitled The Unsung Hero of the Irish Peace Process. He has been Honored, he's been honorary counsel for the Republic of Malta in the United States. He is a proprietor of both the Boston and Salem Athenaeums. He's commissioned art for or donated art to the Vatican Museums, the Peabody Essex Museum, the Morgan Library, the Cape Cod Museum of Art, the New Britain Museum of American Art, the American Museum in Britain, and the University of Virginia Museum of Art. To commemorate the individuals and the groups, uh, that um, uh, and their successes with whom he worked, uh, setting the individual, I'm sorry, setting the, in motion impactful events in Ireland, the Balkans, India, the Middle East, and elsewhere, and to celebrate inclusion, acceptance of diversity, and peace. Highland in 2012 commissioned Maestro Joseph Vela to compose the Call to Peace Fanfare, Peace Mass, and Peace feature, Fanfare and Anthem all of which Vela insisted on naming after Christopher. He wrote the lyrics for the Mass Credo and later Kosovo Hope, a hymn in honor of Kosovo and that country's remarkable constitution. The peace pot process premiered in Malta and has been performed in New York City at St. Patrick's and at Pristina to celebrate Kosovo's 15th anniversary. It's also been presented at the Pantheon in Rome there are plans for a Washington and London performance of the Peace Mass. Um, he's been given he's given numerous lectures and talks, most recently at the University di Roma, known as LUMSA, and he'll be giving a lecture at the Sorbonne Paris on October 17, following which he will be addressing the French National Assembly. 
His favorite book is The Secret Garden. His favorite work of fiction, The Last Period. The most important words of advice directly given to him by Martin Luther King. Quote, look evil in the eye and give it no succor. Christopher lives in New York City with his partner, Constantino. Christopher will tell you about Bobby and the Kings and the Queen and the Field of Gold. Christopher Highland. I'm very impressed and thankful for that wonderful introduction. And most of all, I'm keenly happy to be here this evening with all of you. The first two speakers were fantastic. They addressed aspects of Bobby's life that I could never quite say in the same way. I am coming from the experience with Bobby in indeed a very different direction. But thank you, Robert and Jane, for affording me this opportunity to render homage to Bobby. It is particularly great also to see Ethan Bond Watts here this evening, who formed so much a collaboration with Bobby. Bobby Osbach appeared in our textile showroom in New York's iconic design and decoration building in 2018 looking for Highland Textile to be incorporated as top covering for what I came to understand would be a remarkable work of art, a sculpture, an eye machine inspired in shape and scale only by a generic rectangular stand-up campaign tent. That would be the only generic aspect of his work, rest assured. Bobby's textile quest at Christopher Highland contributed to him creating a thoroughly remarkable work of art, one dedicated to peace and inner emotional journey, namely, quote, place for continuous eye contact, an eye machine, six or so first exhibited in the 2019 Governor's Island Portal Art Fair, New York City. I suggested Bobby consider incorporating into his machine an extraordinary, very intricate, gold-threaded lampus, namely the field of the cloth of gold, which you see on the exterior of the work just to my right which honors an event and a book. The event, the 1520 summit between King Francis I of England and Henry VIII of England, a peace summit, so named because everything at the summit was gold, from the tents to the clothing. In a moment, I will discuss the book. At first, unknowingly, during our initial conversations, I alluded to core tenets that I came to understand also formed and animated Bobby's art. In particular, peace, conservation, harmony, and self and community awareness. We found common ground by having worked on peace initiatives. We spoke extensively about that. Bobby chose Field of the Cloth of Gold, he finding the story behind the cloth's name fascinating. He gave the ancient peace summit three-dimensional life in his work. His extraordinary camping tent only in form and shape, interactive sculpture, sculpture would become, in my estimation, Bobby's built world tribute to tents struck at the field of the cloth of gold and to however figuratively all tents pitched in the effort to attain personal fulfillment, equity, justice, inclusion, understanding, and indeed peace, the most important to Bobby. 
Bobby was animated by a desire to express worldly, noble aspirations, all the while attaining his own inner journey and encouraging the same for others, all best expressed in his art, in his machines. Bobby very much appreciated that our golden cloth also honored the peace of mind achieved in the characters in Francis Hodgson Burnett's book, The Secret Garden, my mother's and my favorite childhood book. The insecurities overcome in that story are achieved in great part by engaging the world, thereby allowing for individual inner and outer peace, a golden state indeed. I sent a copy of the book to Bobby. During the times Bobby and I interacted in our showroom at the exhibition, over dinner in our apartment, over the telephone on a number of occasions, he judiciously balanced discussion of his emotional challenges, allowing just enough to inform his artistic efforts. I consider our conversations a gift, for they afforded me insightful understanding of Bobby's art. Fortuitously, a long period of increasing anticipation preceded our experiencing Bobby's outstanding completed work. In the event, one entered a sublime secret garden in Bobby's space for continuous eye contact and permit me to add field of the cloth of gold, tent, or as it also has been described, dome or machine, the latter name I prefer the most, machine. Single eye to single eye gaze with Constantino seated opposite me was itself a unique experience. That while each of us was clothed in from head to toe and seated in a sea of multicolored pom-poms, the surreal enveloped us the subconscious allowing a space for the unimaginable. I was profoundly moved, transformed with emotions evoked, not unlike those I experienced in the Sistine Chapel upon first seeing Michelangelo's image of God reaching out to man and recalling Handel's, the Messiah's twinkling of an eyelid moment. After having been consumed by the experience, while we were still in the machine, Bobby and I discussed the peace summit of the field of gold and much more, some of which is in his video archive. Place for continuous eye contact, cloth of the piece of gold, a seminal artistic expression of our era is the only work of contemporary plastic art that I have encountered or found that so aptly and profoundly addresses the issue of peace, both between individuals, communities, and indeed nations, and within and without ourselves. In that very important sense, Bobby did achieve his stated goal, quote, and now I am going to make the most beautiful sculpture in the world, end of quote. I told Bobby his works were an artistic world expression of aspects of what Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. King, and Mandela, Mandela espoused spiritually and indeed politically, and that his meditative eye-to-eye -eye contact allowed us to, at least in part, recognize some aspects of the good and that we could even at times look evil in the eye and indeed give it no sucker, as Martin Luther King told me as a schoolboy. That Bobby attained great artist, artistic uh, success by assembling one to the unlikely other 
what might appear to be nonsensical items to some, and technologies accentuated that achievement. His is an artistic expression moving us beyond that achieved by Salvador Dali, who I knew and dined with. Barbie's seemingly randomly found items meshed to technologies animate what I think of as Sir Awareness. Barbie profoundly engaged the subconscious to very good purpose indeed, in so doing avoiding shallow escapism. In his work, he embraced the nonsensical to invite it and to invite the sensical to, di to dinner. Well done, Bobby. Countless cheers. Bobby and I discussed the possibility of place for continuous eye contact and his other works appearing in tandem with the performance of the Peace Mass in concert I commissioned from Maestro Josephella. When the Peace Mass was performed in February in Pristina, Kosovo, to celebrate that country's 15 years of independence, and in Rome, organized by the Vatican Foundation this past June at the Parthenon, that performance in defense of the Kosovo Constitution, I imagined Bobby's work participating. Imagine, as I'm sitting next to uh, a foreign minister and a prime minister, I'm thinking of Bobby's work being in the middle of the Parthenon. As I watched the coronation of King Charles and, and Queen Camilla, I imagined the royal canopy should have been envisioned by Bobby, one dedicated to peace, the event evoking the field of the cloth of gold aesthetic and Bobby's art. Bobby and Queen Elizabeth hold something very much in common, namely the field of the cloth of gold fabric, which you see here, was the very last textile Her Majesty decorated with in the last months before her death. Her Majesty sent me a message mentioning that the secret garden was also like it was for my mother and became for Bobby a book that Her Majesty read in her youth. When I visited the Queen's chaplain, Canon Martin Pohl, at Windsor Great Park, I spoke of Bobby and his remarkable tent machine dedicated to peace. Bobby Osbach's Place for Continuous Eye Contact, Cloth of the Field of Gold, wants to be installed in an important art museum there for posterity, representing a brilliant artist and our collective historic quest for peace, but most important so that Bobby's voice in support of peace, conservation, and self-awareness be perpetually heard. Having lived downtown for almost 50 years in New York City, frequently visiting galleries in Soho, the East Village, and Chelsea, I am familiar with the ebb and flow of the art market, a business that may in some ways be compared to speculative trading. Bobby stood very much out of that milieu. Yes, uh, he may have wanted recognition, but on his own very, indeed, altruistic terms. My mentioning that his machine be shown to the Peabody Essex Museum, or that the cloth of gold presented an interesting story met with appreciation, but he did not engage the matter. It is for us, for Robert and Jane, members of his family who were doing so well, and his friends who were doing so well, to court history for Bobby, assuring him the place and uh, assuring, uh, assuring him the place he and his peace and conservation inspired art much deserve. Bobby's intense, continued body of work, similar to that of Gerald Murphy's in number, will in time contribute much to informing future historians of this most highly transformative era. Bobby expressed in art what Walter Benjamin at times expressed in his writings, namely the reward that seeing clearly affords us, 
that akin to the age-old adage, the honest see clearly. But unlike, much admired by me, Walter Benjamin's angel of history, courtesy, courtesy Clay, only seeing history as despair, Bobby saw ultimately hope. That he furthered through people literally looking into each other's eyes. In this elemental, profound gesture, we are transformed. Broadly applied to communities, the human condition improves. Bobby's machine sees hope in history. Bobby's complex emotional experiences, including his personal dream works, animated much of his life choices and informed his art. He intermittently, withdrawing from periods of momentary or extended deep meditation. Fate most probably called to animate an eternal meditation, one that was, however seemingly contradictory, of his own volition. The lake waters, his portal to heaven. I'm reminded of my neighbor, Quintin, Quint, uh, painter Quinton Oliver Jones' poem, Dreams. Have you seen many worlds? Not one have I. For all I wander in perspective here ends without ending in unseen everywhere, so far away. Yes, I am small and plain, but how I ache to know the beautiful, to touch the flowers I dream, to give my heart the skiff to poke along that stream upwards to that lake. I know the hush is there, like winds grown still. A sense of stillness, calm, serenity, well-being, thoughtfulness, and good company, all in good measure, characterize Bobby's demeanor, that belaying the complexity of Bobby's emotional life. My own near-problematic aqua experiences each the subject of a painting by Oliver Quinton Jones, enabled me to better understand Bobby's personally experienced aqua dreamscapes, which impacted the creation of his most important work. Bobby exuded holiness. His serenity permeates my recognitions of him. Bobby and I shared thoughts on Buddhism, my having visited in my youth onward several monasteries in Nepal and Ladakh. We talked about visiting them together. My guide and the monks when I departed told me I would not be gone, but rather indeed always there among the Himalaya. Bobby is much closer to us than that. Bobby is in our eyes. His art predicated upon us seeing intently, persistently, and clearly. That a pre prerequisite on the way to attaining peace and harmony. Bobby, however, symbolically, is forever woven into the peace ethos of the field of the cloth of gold. And the secret garden is indeed his story. However far flung the guideposts we follow in this room and beyond may bring us in our dreams, in our meditations, on terra firma, or in indeed the hereafter, when we engage a person of deep spirituality, we encounter Bobby. Bobby, his art and spirit eternal, is indeed not lost, but simply gone before. We had planned to have some time. Wow, that was amazing.
We had planned to have some time for questions and answers to a group of four people. They were going to be Ethan and Saul and Elizabeth and Christopher. But I've changed my mind. It's 7.54. We only have six minutes left. So I am going to, without his knowledge of this in advance at all, ask Saul to come up and say a few words extemporaneously, and hopefully they will be worthy of what we've heard here before you. So, get up here. Come on. I didn't know Bobby. Never met him. Never saw the work while he was alive. I was called in to assemble a jigsaw puzzle of what was left behind. I was, the first thing I was asked was, were the, was it worthwhile? And I, my immediate answer was yes. The work was worth preserving. The work was worth sustaining. The visionary Bobby, I have no idea of. My knowledge of Bobby is from hard drives, iPhones, Instagrams, vid videos, and so on. Memos to self, all of which we took to preserving. I put together a team that was amazing. I want to thank David Goodman, who preserved everything that was substantially Bobby. Everything that was necessary and discarded all the crap that Bobby left behind. In terms of the programming, and there's two weeks of programming that we've decided on, I want to thank Sarah Griffin, who has done an amazing job of making connections, making connections that I, who come from the art world, would have never made. Connections to communities and constituencies that are very much in keeping with what seemingly were Bobby's interests. I want to thank Madison, who has kept us on track, who has done amazing, an amazing amount of work, all on the last minute, all on overnight calls, all on We did this all because we believed it was a project worth doing. We did this all because we thought these works needed to be preserved. How? That's still a mystery to me. The only thing I can say about this project is I'm still waiting for something to go wrong. <laughs> this is one of the smoothest projects I've ever worked on. And we hope that it will have effect. The only, the only other thing I want to do is correct Bob. I actually introduced him, uh, them to Karen. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Thank you all for participating. I hope this has been a meaningful experience for all of you. Thank you. Before we get back to viewing what Bobby and others have created, there is one last thing we are going to show you. If you would direct your attention to the back of the room, which currently shows you Bobby's picture from when he was in fourth grade or something, we are now going to show you the reaction of Christopher and, and Constantino to their experience in the cloth of gold. Bobby, could you do me a favor? That was so incredible. 
I did think of Francis and King Henry in helmets looking at each other in the field of gold. Yeah. Beautifully done. Your Thank you. Your execution, your vision artistically is superb. Thank you. Now, can I ask you one favor? Yeah, what's can that? You come in and just film that inside film a little this? bit for like one minute yeah. as the thing goes on. Do you know what I mean? There's a, uh, yeah. That would be great if it would be all possible. It I is. literally being done right now. felt like I was on another planet. It was transformative, informative, emotionally stirring, and a very strong work of art. Great. For the era and for the time. Yeah. So great you have this face in this sea of color. I know. It, it's transcendent. It's, it's, it's uplifting. It's spiritual. It's divine. Thank you for the experience. Thank you, thank of course. You. Now, if You're you could just welcome. film in here when it happens. I just filmed it. it. Yeah. I just did. Oh, it's done. No, but I mean when oh, the when lights are changing. Bobby, could you do me a favor? That was so... It was a lot, uh, a lot more painless than mushrooms, I think. It was very, um, it was a real, I mean, not to probe too deep into that, it really played with the optics and like messing with the optic nerve and disembodying your sense of vision from processing what you see. So that was really great. I really enjoyed that. It was a certain like, freedom from having to think through what you see all the time. And so you kind of just allowed, I, I mean, I don't know the, the chemistry of it, but it allowed the, like, the sort of eye nerves to start just kind of playing with, with pure light and color, and then, and then your brain obviously like, sort of approached that in a different way. So it was, it was great, it was very liberating. Cool, I'm glad I did that. Yeah. All right.
So it's a two. Get your shot. <laughs> There's nothing macabre going on, right? No, no, it's no, all chill. Just, just music. It's literally this music. It's their first opening. Don't fuck me over. I would not. All right. Ready? Yeah. Okay. 